Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the City and County of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the March 25th, 2024 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.31 p.m. Thank you for joining us today for this live stream meeting format due to the weather conditions. Participants have ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. Please take a moment to do, the, do so right now. We ask that those attending to speak, uh, please use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Reminder during the business agenda that TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions and members of the public may speak during public comments. At this time, uh, Dr. Cog will uh, list the attendees. Uh, if for some reason you do not hear your name at this time, um, please email Dr. Cog staff, Pam Kennedy at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. At this time, Cam, would you like to call out the members present? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in attendance, as I see the names coming in, we have Phil Greenwald, Art Griffith, Alex Hyde Wright, Angie Riviera Malpetti, uh, Bill Soroy, Brody Ayers, Carson Priest, Christina Lane, David Kritzinger, Don Sluter, uh, Frank Bruno, Eric Slater, Hillary Simmons, Jeff Dakenbring, Jeffrey Boyd, uh, Jessica Micklebust, Kent Mormon, Larry Nemo, Maria de Andre, uh, Michelle. Uh, Riccio, uh, Michelle Melanakis, Sarah Grant, Sean Poe, Wally Wirt, um, Aaron Busto, and those are all the attendees I see at this moment, Madam Chair. Thank you, Cam. Um, if you did not hear your name, um, please do email uh, Cam Kennedy to make sure that you are added for the record. And at this time, um, I would like to turn it over to Jacob um, to introduce uh, some new members and give some updates on the TAC recruitment. Yep, thank you, Chair Grant. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, on behalf of Dr. Cog's staff, just wanna thank everyone for your flexibility today. We miss seeing you here in person, but wanted to keep everyone safe. Um, secondly, a housekeeping item um, as a virtual meeting uh, for those who are members and alternates. Uh, we are promoting you to panelists and not just attendees in the Zoom meeting. So if you do get a panelist pop up, um, please accept that. Um, in terms of membership, a couple things to note. Um, last month, we welcomed two new members. Um, one of them was Angie Rivera Malpietti, our new equity special interest seat member. Um, she was not able to join us last month, but knowing that she's participating today, just wanted to give her um, a warm welcome. And then I also wanted to acknowledge Fred Roland Hagen, who recently resigned as the community development director in Clear Creek County. Um, Fred, had, uh, Fred had been in Clear Creek County and had been either a member or an alternate on our transportation advisory committee for at least a decade, if not much more. Um, Fred was one of the pillars in our um, planning community in this region. I hope he's actually not listening today. I hope he's actually doing something more, more fun. But I wanted to acknowledge his contributions um, and his um, everything that he's done uh, for both the county, for the region, and for the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Chair Grant. Thank you, Jacob. Well, we appreciate Fred's uh, contributions to Dr. Cog Tech, and welcome to Angie. And now this time, we will now open the meeting for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes. After the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Please raise your hand by um, pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. And if you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone and you'll have three minutes to speak. As a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding the agenda item. At this time, do we have um, anybody uh, virtually that has any public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll give it a minute, but I don't see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. 
just give it another moment here. Again, to please uh, raise your hand, or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on to the next item. It will be the uh, meeting summary from the February 26, 2024 PAC meeting summary. If there's any discussion, corrections, or questions regarding the meeting summary, um, please raise your hand. Give me a moment here. I currently do not see any hands raised. Thank you for reviewing the meeting summary and uh, seeing no um, corrections or about the, um, sorry, the meeting summary. Uh, we'll move on to those, uh, we'll stand as um, submitted. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our first action item for today, which is item four in your packet, attachment B, the Federal Transit Administration, sec section 5310, fiscal year 24 funding awards. And I'll turn it over to Travis Noon, program manager, of administration and finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint here real quick. All right. Appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, again, I'm Travis Newton, Program Manager of Grant Compliance for the Area Agency on Aging at Dr. Cog, uh, presenting to you all today the recommendations for the 2024-2025 Awards for Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, Dr. Cog is the designated recipient of these of the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding for the Denver Aurora Urbanized Area. Section 5310 funds are used to support capital operating and mobility management projects in the in the region uh, that help meet the needs of older adults and individuals with disabilities. <clears throat> Generally speaking, we release a call for projects on a yearly basis, and we released this call for this year uh, back in November of 2023. Uh, we received requests from 10 organizations requesting nearly $4.1 million uh, based on you know, partial apportionments that are out there currently for, from the FTA, as well as some unspent funding from prior fiscal years. Uh, there's approximately 3.5 million available for the period this year for July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Uh, Dr. Cog does convene a panel of experts and stakeholders across the region to review all these applications and to make these recommendations that are being presented to you all today. Uh, this here is the list of the recommended award amounts. It's also in your agenda packet with a little bit more detail, including the amount of the requests. Um, the committee, when reviewing these, prioritized giving funding to ongoing operating projects and the mobility management projects in the region. Uh, these are generally ongoing support to uh, help uh, meet the needs of older adults and individuals with disabilities across the region. Uh, then, you know, the committees started looking at the capital projects um, and looking at those in the same vein of in ensuring continuing operations by prioritizing the replacement vehicles over any sort of expansion or any changes there. Um, there were three projects that weren't recommended for funding. That includes the uh, vehicle expansion for support management. Um, again, with that one, the committee felt more strongly towards the replacement vehicles that support management was requesting on. Uh, and then two software projects, one from the city and county of Broomfield, which uh, there was concern there that that should have been more of an ongoing operating cost because it was a yearly licensing fee. And then the software from a little help where there was concern about whether or not the readiness of that project was there to be able to start. I do have the recommended motion here for you all as well, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee has about the projects, the, the process, or anything like that. Pass it back to you, Chair. Great. Thank you, Travis. Thank you for that update. Are there any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? I see a hand there. Uh, David Kretzinger. I'll move to recommend the Regional Transportation Committee approve the federal, uh, or the, the TAC approve the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 awards for the period July 1st through June uh, 2025, as recommended by the panel. Thank you, David. Uh, do we have a, a second?
Kent Mormon. Uh, yes, second. Thank you, Kent. Uh, is there any uh, further discussion on this item? Uh, seeing Madam that. Chair. Oh, uh, Sorry, Madam Chair. Yes. Go ahead. I, um, Chair Grant, this is Ron Papsdorf for Dr. Cog. Um, just want to know that I know a couple people made some notations in chat. I would I would ask that members today, um, given the meeting format, if you are uh, please refrain from putting chat messages in the chat that that relate to the business of the committee. So, if you have to abstain from voting for some reason, please announce that um, as part of the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that see the chats now. Um, okay, so we have a second, uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Frank, do you have a discussion or? Oh, just to say that I need to announce that I'm rec uh, recusing from the vote. Sure, uh, we'll, we'll take those at the end um, for okay. any abstentions. Thank you, Frank. Um, so for all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, anyone opposed? Uh, signify by saying no. Hearing none, uh, any abstentions at this time? I'm Don Sluter. I abstain with the city of Lakewood is why I'm abstaining. Thank you, John. And Frank Bruno via Mobility Services, I abstain. Thank you, Frank. Hillary Simmons with a little help, I also abstain. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. The motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Travis. We'll move on to the next action item. Uh, item number five in your packet. This is update to taking action on regional vision zero plan. This is attachment C in your packet. I'll hand it over to Emily Kleinfelter, safety and regional vision zero planner. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Emily Kleinfelter. Like we said, I am the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, I was just here last month to give you all a brief um, update and overview of the work we've been doing over the last year to our taking action on Regional Vision Zero Plan. Um, and today I'm just going to be giving you um, another brief overview of that of that update work, how that went, some of the feedback that we heard from the community, um, how that was implemented, and then what our next steps are. There we go. Um, so some of the objectives of the update, we were looking at taking a holistic approach to updating, taking action on Regional Vision Zero um, in order to create some valuable and sustainable um, ways to address safety for all of these multiple aspects across the region, hope, um, ultimately with the goal of achieving our, our goal of vision zero or zero fatalities and serious injuries. And, um, you know, we did not update the entire plan. We were really mainly looking at updating certain components within the plan, um, and I'll get into that in later slides. But we also were looking at creating an accompanying story map as a resource for um, local staff and partners and our own uh, staff as well to um, use as a resource in complementing the, the action plan. And then lastly, we were also um, wanting to make sure that our plan was up, uh, meeting the upcoming state um, accessibility requirements. So a little insight of the structure of the update. We started in June, or well, we did not start this. This plan was adopted in June of 2020 originally by the Dr. Cog board. And then in February of 2023, we began the strategic update work with a kickoff workshop and a briefing to TAC. Um, then in March, or from March to September of 2023, we conducted objective workshops and I came again to the TAC to give a briefing on that work. 
And then we moved into October where we actually met here at Dr. Cog offices in this room for an in-person workshop that was to do prioritization and timeline activities for the actions. And then in January and February of this year, uh, or sorry, through January to February of this year, we had a public comment period. Um, and then I, I came to you again in February last month for a briefing. And here we are now in March of 2024. Um, we are looking to um, ask for the recommendation of approval of the draft strategic update. And then um, with that approval, we will then be taking it to the next committee, RTC, and then ultimately to board for their approval. So as I mentioned, we were not um, taking a full comprehensive update to the plan, but rather a strategic one and looking at updating certain components that was really focusing on chapter six, the implementation plan. Um, this is the, the really meat and potatoes, as I say, of the plan here, um, where we list the actions and strategies that we hope will get us to our goal of zero. And then we also, as I mentioned, created that vision zero story map as a complementary resource. We held about um, six to seven virtual workshops over the course of six to seven months where we um, had the regional vision zero work group stakeholders participating in um, a new form of, of engagement over online called Mural where we had um, virtual workshops there and then ultimately came together for one in-person workshop that helped us determine action timelines and priority. And then we brought things to the public. We had a 30-day period from January 29th to February 27th where we asked, uh, we put things we put things, we put the entire plan um, and the um, components that were updated out for review via um, both our regional Vision Zero work group and social media channels. We had created a website on our social pinpoint site um, that was a, a way for us to engage with the public there. And we, we used Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, and Facebook as ways to get the word out as well as that, that work group. Um, and we received, unfortunately, not that many comments online, but they were, um, we also received some really helpful comments uh, via email from our partners. Um, unfortunately, a majority of the comments were outside the scope of the update. Um, I think we learned our lessons there and, and we um, understood that feedback um, that we heard from folks, we implemented that and um, made sure to note anything that was outside the scope was uh, noted for future updates. So some of the outcomes of the update. Um, one of the things we have now is a letter of commitment from our executive director, Douglas Rex. And um, this is something that is seen as sort of a progressive move and we're seeing that um, in, a, in a lot more of our um, peer agencies across the nation. And so um, we are just sort of following in, in step with that. Um, additionally, we created an executive summary. Um, it's sort of just the status quo for reports these days to have that executive summary. And then we updated the list of our countermeasures. Um, we wanted to also make sure we were in line with best practices. And so reviewing our countermeasures, um, we updated those to be in line with FHWA's proven safety countermeasures. And then last but not least was that meat and potatoes that I mentioned, the, the regional vision zero implementation plan. Um, that is the objectives that we have laid out and the actionable strategies for us to achieve our goal of, of zero. Um, as I mentioned, those proven safety countermeasures, those were revised to reflect the FHWA list of 28 proven safety countermeasures. Um, each countermeasure lists at least one safety focus area or addresses, excuse me, um, and some of them may be cross-cutting, but those safety areas are speed management, intersections, roadway departures, and pedestrians and bicyclists. And then that regional vision zero implementation plan, um, the components that really create that, that plan are laid out here. You have your action items or a specific effort that we've identified um, along with action leaders and support partners that, or, that can advance this. And then we made sure um, a really important part of this was identifying that time frame. Um, these were assigned to each action item to help give a general time frame to help prioritize our efforts. 
And then this time, uh, sorry, then another thing that we've done is identify both an action leader and our supporting partners. So um, each item has at least one identified action leader as well as um, the various agencies that might be supporting that action. And lastly, one thing for us to help us identify priority and where to really focus our actions was listening from you all, from the Regional Vision Zero work group and our stakeholders. And so from those workshops, I took that information and helped us um, identify the expected impact of these actions. And that's what's laid out here in the new plan. And so just a reminder, um, we are here today at March 2024 at TAC. Um, I will be taking this hopefully to uh, our TC and board in April for their approval. And then once um, all of those, all of our I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and we have everything approved, we will continue to work with the Regional Vision Zero work group to implement these strategies and actions um, throughout this year. Otherwise, um, today I have a proposed motion to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for that presentation update. Are there any questions uh, or comments for Dr. Cogstaff from the TAC? Uh, Frank Bruno. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Emily. I think the plan has been really well, well thought out and well executed along the way, as Emily was just outlining. I think it's been a really thoughtful, logical pathway. The question that I have is, and I, I think I've kind of suggested this in the past, I'm increasingly concerned about the impact that municipal and county budgets is going to have on the plan. So again, the, it's a great plan. I think it's a it, it it's needed, it's necessary. Uh, I like that there's you know opportunities to inform the public about what what this is. But again, I'm, maybe Emily, you can just just briefly speak to what you're hearing uh, in terms. I know there'll be a great deal of desire to uh, continue to implement. But uh, I'm concerned about the enforcement elements, that there just won't be the resources to deal with that. And then will the plan, in essence, be a great plan, but you know, not have any um, structure to it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Frank. Um, so we that's why we really made sure to identify these near-term actions that we believe have you know, a variety of expected impact, and um, we we have identified different partners to address them. And so, you know, it's not a one person is addressing this, and and it's relying on one partner. It's sort of you know we've we've gotten in the the support and um, of all of the different partners at the table, and it's going to be a sustainable effort that way, um, in the hopes that everybody will kind of pitch in and help make sure that we are seeing these actions through. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. I see Rick Pullerbroom has his hand raised. Rick? Um, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Emily, I, I agree with Frank. Uh, good work on this. I've, I've spouted off a time or two about the importance. I, I'm just... I, I'm ju I just continue to be shocked when I see on the news or some TV program the, the kind of um probably well accidents uh, maybe they're not accidents but uh the sort of uh, uh people that are being hurt or killed on the roadways and so i i think this is very critical um i do like the uh the safety focus the four safety focus uh components um where uh i was looking for the link for the actual plan is that something that you could share? Um, yes. So the actual updated plan is is still live right now on that social pinpoint website that we can happily share a link to. Um, but you know that is going to still have some revisions made to it before it becomes publicly available um, later in April. But the the updated plan can be found on our social pinpoint site, which we can share a link with in the chat. 
Okay, and then is there like a promotional rollout once the RTC takes action? Absolutely. Once once all of the approvals and everything um, you know are are made, we will have a whole public um, campaign for making sure that people are aware of this new update and getting the word out about it. Good. I um, at at the risk of. Uh, not being able to do this, I, I think this would be a good, well, uh, clearly the Dr. Cog board is, is a good foundation, but so would a group like the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Um, I, I think the, the broader understanding of uh, the drive to zero uh, and, and the components that we really need to um, socialize I, I think that's pretty important. So, um, I'm I'm hope what whatever I can do to help, uh, I'd be interested in doing that. Yeah, thank you very much, and that's a great um, suggestion with the mayor's caucus. We will look into that. So appreciate that. Great, thank you, Angie Rivera Malfiades. You know, as I was reading all the comments under um, all the components like equity and what is vision zero. Under equity, looking at that uh, data point that 41% of high injury networks include in areas higher than average in poverty and minority populations. And I can't help but wonder if we should not also and the disabled community. Um, because I think they probably have a higher propensity of getting injured as well because of the lack of mobility or being able to move fast. So I know that's not part of this, but I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Thank you, Angie. Any other um, questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? Please raise your hand. If none, uh, there is a proposed motion um, on the screen. Uh, Kent Mormon. Yeah, uh, I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Thank you, Kent. Frank Bruno. I'll second. Thank you, Frank. Is there any, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, uh, take a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All those opposed signify by saying no. Hearing none, any abstentions? No abstentions, hearing none. Um, the motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Cog, for your time and effort on this uh, strategic Vision Zero update. And thank you for the update, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our action items uh, for today. Um, the next few items are discussion items. Uh, item number five in your packet is attachment D. This is the Colorado Travel Counts 2024 Household Travel Surveys. And I will hand it over to Steve Cook, Manager of Mobility Analytics and Operations. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna be very brief here. And really I'm just going to uh, introduce uh, Eric Sabina of the Colorado Department of Transportation to talk about this very important uh, activity that's gonna go on over the next year. Um, he's gonna give you more information, but I just wanna stress the importance of this set of uh, household travel surveys that are gonna be conducted over 12 months and how important it is to many of our activities at Dr. Cog and also to local governments who will be able to um, that's going to come out of this effort. So 
Eric, are you there? Would you like to share a screen or should I advance? I am here and uh, hi everyone. And uh, whichever way makes most sense to you, Steve, I can do either one. I'll advance. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, next slide then, please. As, as Steve mentioned, uh, hi everyone, I'm Eric Sabina. I'm Deputy Director of the uh, DTD at uh, CDOT. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back at uh, Dr. Cog Committee. I spent almost 15 years uh, at Dr. Cog and in, in, uh, some years past. I've been at CDOT for a while now. Uh, this really is, you know, as the agenda item implies, just sort of an informational uh, uh, presentation. It'll be quite brief with just a very simple little awareness type of ask at the end. Uh, the surveys like this are conducted roughly every decade or so at uh, MPOs and uh, many states. Uh, the last one that was conducted in Colorado was called the Front Range Travel Counts. We're trying not to think too hard about the survey names. Uh, you know, and uh, that survey was uh, led by uh, Dr. Cog's staff at the time. It just covered the Front Range, as the name implies. And uh, uh, that survey was quite successful. Uh, the consultant uh, was on budget. We obtained very good data that was used by all the Front Range's MPOs, uh, Dr. Cog, you know, very certainly, and, and uh, was used for modeling and analysis across the Front Range. Uh, at uh, subsequently, Dr. or CDOT actually used the same survey when building the statewide travel model. The, the project that we're now engaged in and that I'm you know, here to talk to you a, a little bit about today is essentially to repeat that project at the state level. So uh, Steve, if you, next slide, please. A bit on the schedule, uh, oops, one further, there you go, thank you. Um, a bit on the schedule, uh, this whole thing has taken longer than we hoped because of some global pandemic that happened that we're all trying to forget all about. Uh, we were involved in funding and partnership discussions back in, uh, you know, 18. We actually selected the consultant in 2020. I like to tell people that the first Zoom meeting I ever did was the interview of the consultant for this project in May of 2020. I was uh, quite nervous that something was going to go wrong and we were going to get a challenge since I've had, most of us had no experience doing Zoom meetings at that point. But of course, we all have lots now. Uh, after we select the cons the, selected the consultant, we you know, were obviously aware that we were in the middle of a global pandemic. It was having all sorts of unknown effects. Uh, and we were concerned that uh, uh, the travel behaviors that were going on at that time were number one in flux and number two were, uh, um, were you know, going to end at some unknown time in some unknown state. So basically what we did was to slow track the contracting and the planning phase of that project from the you know, mid 2020 through 2022. At a certain point in sort of latter part of 2022, we started to feel like maybe we were seeing some post COVID stability. Uh, and uh, so we proceeded uh, with the pilot survey during which we tested different approaches, particularly to recruiting uh, respondents to see which ones would generate the, the uh, highest response rates and so you know make the survey be as cheap and effective and as possible. Uh, that pilot went very well and we came up with a, a method for uh, recruitment uh, that we and then subsequent to that during most of the rest of last year we were in the process of finalizing a number of planning activities and convinced, commenced the uh, full survey last month uh, and uh, we are scheduled to run the survey through about a whole calendar year. So we're expecting to take all of 2024 and we may run a month or two at the most into 2025. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Thank you. You know, a little bit about the household survey design. We are shooting for 20,000 households. So give or take about 50,000 people. We have uh, IGAs uh, in place with all of our funding partners, uh, the five MPOs particularly where we are as close as we can manage recognizing that surveys are a little bit on, on not fully controllable, but we are uh, targeting uh, and agreeing to provide the number of households that you see here to the uh, various uh, MPOs that are uh, participating in the project, and particularly Dr. Cog having the largest number, not terribly surprising, uh, at 7,500 households uh, when we're all finished with this thing. 
without going into a whole lot of techie nerdy detail, the basic idea of a survey like this is to obtain sample that, you know, air quotes looks like Colorado. So is representative of, of the various age groups, demographic groups uh, across the state so that we're not, you know, overrepresenting one group and underrepresenting another. Uh, next slide, please. We are doing, you know, doing a few, what I call it, sort of specialty uh, elements in the survey that I'd be happy about if people have them. Uh, in central Dr. Cog area, we're oversampling a little bit to make sure that we get enough data on several classes of households uh, and travel behaviors, low-income households, transit users, special modes like scooters, and so on. We're doing something similar in the uh, central area, kind of near the uh, CSU campus in North Front Range. We are also uh, going to be uh, sort of oversampling a couple of selected uh, ski slash resort towns in the mountains to make sure that we obtain you know, good solid data on a couple of those that we feel will be representative of the others. Uh, that includes Summit County and uh, Steamboat. And then finally, uh, we've got you know, a couple of very special, you know, several very special services out there that are long distance uh, transit services that we wanna make sure we get data uh, on those. Uh, given the how small those services are overall, we would be very unlikely to get many respond, respondents who are using those services if we just relied on our random uh, uh, bus stops and on board the vehicles for snow stang and ski train last month. And we will be doing similarly on uh, several bus stang routes around the state in uh, probably this coming fall. We're still doing a little discussing on that with the uh, uh, project uh, committee. And then we just wanted to you know, make clear that we have several options for uh, respondents to provide us their data. The basic idea is to have a variety of ways of doing this so that you know, whatever works for you as a respondent, you can use that method. Uh, and that way we're gonna uh, improve the likelihood of that uh, representativeness of the sample. We may find, for example, that older people like me uh, would prefer to uh, respond by telephone telephone interview. Uh, we are trying to uh, push a cell phone app and get as many people to respond by that method as possible. It has a variety of, uh, of advantages of doing that. And we also have an internet site that people can use to uh, provide their data if they prefer that method. Next slide, please. This is like probably day one or day two, but I just wanted to give you a little technical sense of how this project is being managed. This comes from uh, a, a a project oversight website that is available to uh, a variety of the uh, project's participants. Certainly Dr. Cog's staff has uh, uh, the ability to log into this and track how the survey responses are going around the state. You can zoom in more closely. This is just a screen capture from one of the, you know, one of the ways of looking at the map. Uh, and so you can zoom in and see further geographic detail. Uh, next slide, please. And then likewise in the uh, uh, website that we have available that helps us to track the survey as it goes along, we can show a number of statistics. Uh, I mentioned demographic and other types of statistics. So the next couple of slides are just a couple of quick looks at that. So in this case, you can see, for example, uh, how uh, the survey data is coming in through the days of the week. Uh, recruitment, by the way, just means the no, those are the red ones. Those are the people who have uh, agreed to participate, and then the uh, blue ones are the people who actually did participate and send in their data. Next slide, please. So that's about it, other than my ask, which is, you know, it, it has been the case that over the years, sometimes members of the public will, you know, receive something in the mail, which is how we're doing their initial recruitment on this, and wonder if it's legitimate, and from time to time, they'll call their local governments and ask them if they're aware of anything uh, like this going on. Is this really legit? Should I participate? So we're just hoping that if uh, you all receive such uh, communications, you would vouch for the survey. Um, another point we want to make is that this, there's no opt-in on this. People can't you know, go to a website and volunteer to participate. We're trying to get a random, uh, as I said, representative sample of uh, of citizens and households around the state. So those are, we're selecting the people to contact so as to produce that random sample. So this is, you know, just also you might let people know if they 
if they you know call up and say hey how can i participate in this the answer is if if you are invited that's how you can participate it would be very important if, for you to do so and so if you are invited we'd be most grateful if you would participate there is a press release to the uh, for the project and uh, a website uh, i don't expect anybody to try to write down that whole link i always <laughs> Of course, you know, when, when someone puts up a link on the screen and I'm furiously trying to scribble it down on a piece of paper, that never works. So you can just Google Colorado Travel Counts Survey and the thing will come right up. Next slide, please. And that's about it. That's my contact information, the standard state DOT and state government uh, email, ASABINA at state.co.us. Happy to answer any questions that you may have to the extent there's time to do so. And thank you all for your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I see a couple hands raised. Uh, I'll start with uh, Frank Gray. Hey, Eric. Frank Gray, uh, Castle Rock EDC. Quick question for you. Do you guys supplement this with any kind of uh, um, geo-tracking uh, data stuff, like a placer AI uh, kind of a data set that goes along with the survey, or is it mostly the results of the survey and the, the physical answers themselves that you're looking for. Thanks. You bet. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, we do it, so very briefly, the survey is what's called a travel diary survey. So it is sort of just what the name implies that we ask people to fill out a complete diary for their travel period, which in some cases is only a day and with some respondents we're asking for several days. And we ask them to provide address information as they go through their day for each place that they go. So people who respond either by the phone or by the email will just have those, those point addresses and be able to sort of infer routes that they take to go from one to the next. You, if, for people who download the cell phone app, they will, will uh, as they do that, will be agreeing to uh, put on their GPS tracker. And so during that period, we will track those cell phones and we'll have detailed route information uh, of uh, how they got from each place to each other place. Was that getting at the point of your question? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, because we, we use Placer AI da data all the time to see where people are going to. We use it from a retail standpoint um, mm -hmm. for the most of the time. We want to see where they've been, where they're going, and where they're going after their visit. So are they going from their house to the retail uh, store? Are they going to another retail store? Are they going to another, like, are they going to three or four retailers sure. yep. or are they going back home or are they going to work? When are they doing their shopping and what's their travel pattern? And right. all of that stuff is already available with their mobile phone tracking, uh, apps that are available. So I just felt like that would be a simple solution, um, for, uh, for maybe cost-effective solution. I think we pay like $3,500 a year for the subscription, so. Nice. The, the survey firms over the years, there are a small number of firms that conduct this type of survey, have built their own uh, cell phone apps to gather basically all the information you just described uh, through the cell phone app. And it provides that whole, everything you said, like, you know, where, where were they before a certain place, where they go next, you know, who's in their travel party, what mode did they use to get there and all of that. So there are a lot of very specialized things that we're asking them for as part of this diary that mean that they kind of have to have a specialized tool to do it. But, but to reiterate, you know, I totally agree with the content uh, elements that you just described, and we do get all that kind of information through this type of survey. Understood. It might be something you want to look at because I think you may not have to hire a, a high price consultancy to, to get all of that data, I guess is my point. Is Understood. There, you can go check it out. It's just called placerai.com. We'll do it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Might have some of the info you can get there for a fraction of the cost and, and stay up on the data uh, annually rather than, um, I think they update it monthly to be even honest with you. Like, I think that they track all that stuff every month so you can find the travelers and track them uh, through their cell phone activity. So, just something to look at might be something that as budgets get tighter, might be something that, uh, that might be a, a value. So my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. I've written down Placer AI and I'll definitely take a look at it after this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, next person in line, David Kretzinger. 
Hey, Eric, thanks for your work uh, previously at Dr. Cog and now at CDOT. Uh, nice to have the uh, continuity of your experience. Um, my question is, um, did you um, pre-test the survey instrument? In other words, the list of questions, and if so, what, uh, what did you learn from the pre-test and what modifications are being made um, in the final survey? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, David. Nice to see you. Um, we did test the, the survey instrument, as it's called, during the pilot last, uh, I think it was in February and March, perhaps. And uh, we didn't find anything, you know, that was causing confusion. I mean, that's the usual thing that we find when, when, uh, when we're, especially when we're doing new questions is, have we asked something in, such, in a way that's very confusing to the respondents? Uh, and, you know, we went through that whole process during last fall's or last spring's pilot and did not really run into anything uh, challenging. So we're running it as we had at the time. As, as I know, you know, David, uh, a lot of the questions that we ask are much the same from previous iterations of this through like 2010, for example. So we try to keep those questions stable for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, as you and I are, are aware, it's, it's always a lot easier to confuse people with your questions than, than we ever think. So once we get a question that doesn't seem to confuse people, we try to leave it that way and not mess with it. And the other uh, reality is that to the extent that we ask the questions the same way through one survey to the next, we have a good comparability between one survey and the following one. So you know we have all that data from 2010 and we'll be able to compare those data to this one, which provides a lot of benefits. Newer questions can be challenging, and we definitely have some this time. We were asking a lot of questions, for example, about home deliveries, you know, and products that people are, are ordering, as we all do all the time these days, uh, through the mail. And uh, that was, of course, kind of not a thing in 2010. So that generated a, a lot of head scratching for us, but those questions seem to have been worded in a non-confusing way. So anyway, the long-winded answer to your question, but feel it looks, seems like the instrument's pretty good, and we're moving ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next person in line has their hands raised, uh, Rick Pilgrim. Uh, thanks again, Madam Chair. Um, hey, Eric, uh, it's good to see you, as, as David said. Um, the survey work then will finish up in January of next year, 25. Uh, sure. But then what about the model work? When, when, when would you expect uh, forecast to be available using the new survey data, uh, both at the state level and perhaps at the Dr. Cog level, if you could speak to that. I can partially speak to it. Um, you know, so right away, we'll be able to do just sort of analytics from it. For updating the travel models themselves, I mean, the way this is going to work is what we did in 2010 also, which is we just provided the survey data to the MPOs that, you know, they had their models on whatever schedule they you know think best so as far as dr cog is concerned i'll defer you know probably to, to steve to give you an answer on that one uh, I, I will say that we expect to have the data available in 2025 for people to start using there's usually some cleanup process at the end where we're just double checking things and filling some holes and gaps so it's not like as soon as we're done in the field that the data is instantly available and done but you know, probably mid 2025, it'll be available and then people could start working on their models at that time. As far as uh, CDOT is concerned, you know, we will no doubt start updating our model uh, kind of right away. And I, but we don't, I don't have an answer for you on, on how, what the schedule of, of sort of lighter duty updates versus like big ones would be. I will just note that one of the things that Steve Cook knows I was terribly pushy about in the planning stages of this project was to try to make sure that we got weekend data, which we are going to be doing and will be the first time we've ever gotten weekend data. And one of our, from CDOT's perspective, as you know, a big, a big part of our responsibility in planning and congestion issues is, is I-70 corridor, Mountain I-70. And so we're going to be uh, thinking while the survey project is going on about how we could use it. In fact, we've already done quite a lot of thinking about how we might start to develop more weekend capabilities for models and extend our models to be able to handle weekends as well. Uh, I think that's going to be a bit challenging. So I don't expect it to be a super short project, Rick, because I don't, you know, it's a pretty rare thing for people to do weekends. So we are still in the head scratching phase about what that model should look like. 
but I would expect it to be in a small number of coming years after we're done with the survey that we should have something in hand that will be a heck of a lot better at uh, supporting uh, I-70 corridor projects than we are now. Ah, I see there's a question in the chat. Will the mode or fuel type be collected? Uh, the answer is yes, mode and fuel type. The, the, we're going to be gathering all the travel modes that a person can kind of think of, <laughs> and uh, we will definitely be getting fuel type uh, in the vehicles. So yeah, we're, we are super dialed in on that topic and as, as anxious as anyone can be to, to have that information and be provided, of course, to all the MPOs. And, Thank you. Uh, this is Steve Cook here, and I'll do a quick response to uh, to Rick there regarding uh, Dr. Cog's modeling efforts. Um, we hope to have you know quote a updated model done early 2026. I have Jacob looking at me like, can it be earlier than that so we can use it for the the uh, update of the uh, 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, we just don't know. There's always so many uh, things going on when you update a model, a lot of number crunching with the survey data. Um, one other thing, thing we'll be doing with this is within Dr. Cog's kind of suite of models, we'll be doing updates to our commercial vehicle model, which is kind of a separate component. So everything from big trucks to little vans, as Eric mentioned, of package deliveries, and also for uh, DEN, DIA uh, trips to and from there, not only you know passengers, but also the freight of uh, movements in and out and trips going to and from the uh, remote uh, parking lots. So there's gonna be a lot going on with that uh, over the next couple of years, but we're, we're ultra optimistic is you know very early 2026. Um, Eric's probably laughing right now, no. Um, but we uh, hope to have it then, but there'll be a lot going on and we'll probably likely be reporting back here and there and and asking for some assistance or information maybe from local governments if there's particular areas of the region that we're really trying to you know improve in the model. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that additional information. Yeah, I just say in conclusion, you know, we're very excited about the project and very grateful to all the MPOs, obviously Dr. Cog included, uh, for uh, participating in the project. We are hitting a couple of firsts on this project. This I I did I neglected to mention that this is the first statewide travel survey that's ever been done in Colorado, and so we're going to be gathering data from parts of the state that have never been surveyed before. So that's very exciting. And as I already mentioned, we're going to be getting weekend data for the first time ever, also. So we're we're really excited about both of those things. Thank you. And that's about it. I think Ron, uh, Ron Papsdorf um, has an additional question Thank or you, comment. Grant, and thank you, Eric, for being here. I really appreciate it. And this really is an important effort to all of our, our future planning efforts and look forward to this information. Um, I, I wanted, I'm curious a little bit about uh, obviously recognizing the, the extreme importance of a survey like this to have a statistically valid and representative sample. And that's why there's no sort of opt-in provision for people to volunteer to participate. But then help me understand that in the context of specifically recruiting people that are on uh, bus stang, snow stang, ski stang, uh, ski stang, which are very ski trained, which are very specific services, and how you're making sure that by recruiting from specific users of specific transportation routes or services that you're not oversampling them or skewing results. Thanks, Ron, and I appreciate that question. And uh, there are some very model nerd levels of answer to your question. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that out of the 20,000 households, we're shooting for just a small number of hundreds on those services. So the, the overall share of the, of the survey that's gonna be represented in those, of, of riders in those services is very small. So the amount of skewing that it's gonna do of the sample is, is also gonna be pretty tiny. The other thing that's normal to do in, in uh, travel surveys, in, and this is, this is where the super nerdy part comes in. Uh, when we, with, with certain really unusual behaviors like taking long distance transit, 
uh, we, we're very interested in getting data on those users because it's super important for figuring out what sorts of people use them and what their sensitivities are to the services and all of that. So we really need to make sure we get actual users of those, of those services. But as I, I think I mentioned before, if, if we just try to hope we'll get some from the random sample, our chances are very small because there are, very, there are you know, a very small number of such users. So, so, number, so the first thing to say is that the data that we're getting from those actual onboard and at the bus stop uh, uh, recruitments will just be used for what's called model estimation. So that's this you know, sort of statistical modeling portion of building the models. And then we don't include them in the larger sample when we're trying to calculate, uh, you know, let's say somebody wants to know what are the average number of trips in high versus medium versus low income households. I'm just, you know, picking an answer at random. And we might imagine that the people who ride those services are higher income, perhaps since so we don't include the, the uh, folks that we got off of those intercept surveys in an analysis like what are the uh, trip rates for high versus medium versus low. So we kind of keep them off on the side. So I, I could go on at some length about that, but that's a partial answer to your question. Did, did that, uh, was that satisfactory at all, Ron? No, Eric, thank you. That That's helpful. So if I, just to recap my, my understanding, your response, you're, I mean, Perfectly logical for any business enterprise to survey its business users, its customers, to learn about that in terms of how they market or provide that business service. So you're doing, you're taking advantage of this opportunity, this survey opportunity, to get some of that. But for the most part, a lot of that response is not going to be included in the overall statewide travel survey results. Am I understanding Correct. that correctly? That's correct. So when we're just trying to generate statewide statistics of one sort or another, like the example I gave, we will not be including those the, that small group of respondents in with the numbers that we use to create those those analytics. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I do believe that we have a question from Brian Weimer. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric. Right. Nice to hear from you again. Likewise. Um, hey, I got a question for you, and that is you reference uh, how communities can help. And do you have specific language you would want us to use in terms of pushing out to our media, uh, our websites, any of that that you would like to have us incorporate? I would say maybe the best thing, Brian, is to just go to that uh, uh, press release that uh, as I mentioned, and I think if I'm remembering right, if you just Google Colorado Front Range Travel, or sorry, Colorado uh, Travel Counts Survey, the press release is there, and that's kind of the standard language that we've we've uh, you know standardized on for that. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Brian. Nice to hear your voice. <laughs> thank you. Um, I do have a, a similar question. Um, off of that one, uh, I'm looking at the news release right now. It's pretty lengthy. Um, would there be any kind of shorter kind of blurb that could go in a newsletter? I think agencies would be happy to promote that. And uh, second question is, when would you, when does CEDAW expect those to hit the mailboxes for the Dr. Cog region? I see that this is going on throughout the year, but just wondering if there's a certain time frame that we should be kind of expecting um, these to hit mailboxes and getting questions and also letting the community members know if they do see it in their their mailbox that we uh, support them to uh, to participate. So it, thank you for that question. It is hitting mailboxes in the Dr. Cog region now. Uh, we are, uh, you know, my, my I need to check in on the, the following numbers that I'm going to throw at you because they're approximate, but they are uh, mailing each week. And so far, they've been mailing at about 3,000 uh, mailers a week, and that's across the whole state. So if we were to go back a few slides and you would see like the, the very first week, there's a map there of, you know, some the just the recruitments, you know, people who said yes, you would see that there are um, that one. Yeah, there are responses already basically everywhere. So the stuff is hitting in Dr. Cog as well as all over across the rest of the state uh, as we speak. And like I said, each week they're mailing 3,000 now. I think they're going to ramp it up a bit in the coming weeks, up to maybe about 5,000 a week or so. So now is the answer. And, and I will certainly, I'll get with our uh, communications folks 
and uh, ask them to if they are if they don't already have a shorter version of that, I'll ask them to prepare. Great. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Shorter blurb and or maybe some sort of graphic that you all want to use. Uh, be happy to promote that. Okay. And we do have a, an FAQ page as well. I think it's linked into that place that I just sent you, but I'm going to double check that when I get done here. And if it isn't, then I'll arrange to make sure that there's an FAQ that the general public can see also. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments for, for Eric? And thank you so much for bringing this to the Dr. Cog Tech, and we look forward to hearing uh, this project as it rolls on and hearing the results. Thank, thank you, you very for, much. Thank uh, you for giving me some time. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll move on to item number six in your packet. Um, this would be the E470 overview, attachment E. Um, I'll hand it over to Jacob Rieger, Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning, to introduce this item. Yeah, thank you, Chair Grant. So many of us, or maybe even most of us, at one time or another have driven E470 and kind of have that direct experience with the toll road. Um, but E470 Public Highway Authority has been doing a lot of work, both on the planning side and the project side. So we thought it was timely to have them come visit with us and give us a comprehensive update to what's going on at E470. Um, I know in reviewing the slide deck, I learned some things. I think we'll all learn some things that we didn't know about um, the work of E470. So with that, let me introduce their staff, Neil Thompson, the Interim Executive Director, and Jessica Carson, their Public Affairs Director. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, and uh, thank you to the TAC. Uh, my name is Neil Thompson. I'm um, actually Director of Engineering and Roadway Maintenance primarily. I'm filling in as Executive Director uh, while we um, do a search for a new executive director. Um, with your permission, I'd like to um, introduce Jessica Carson to kick us off here. She's our Director of Government and Public Affairs. Thank you, Neil. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, we'll go ahead and, and kick it off and look at what we're going to cover this morning or this afternoon. Really, there we go. Thank you. Um, so I will start with just giving a little bit of a background, high level overview of E470, look at some of our traffic trends and toll rates, what we've been seeing over the last few years there in the community. And then I'm going to kick it back over to Neil um, to probably talk about some of the stuff that this audience is, is more interested in. And that's the capital projects and trail system and a lot of the, the roadway and engineering projects projects that we have going on. And then I will close it up at the end with looking at a little bit broader view of tolling in Colorado. Um, so with that, next slide. So for those that aren't familiar, um, we've been around since the early 90s, um, so over three decades, and we do span 47 miles. Um, we are made up of the eight member jurisdictions that our 47 miles goes through. So that is five cities and three counties. So on the left there, you see our eight voting members. And then Dr. Cog is actually on our board as one of our non-voting members and council member Deborah Mulvey sits on our board of directors representing Dr. Cog. So we thought it was good to come out and talk to this audience about what we have going on. And next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we are 47 miles. Um, we've been open since 1991 when our first segment down south was open. We opened our last segment up north in 2003. And in 2001, we actually launched our Transportation Safety Foundation. So that is one of our um, one of our strong values is focusing on safety, and that's a big piece of cover with a lot of the projects that we have going on. Um, and then we did go all cashless in 2009. Um, we were the first in the country actually to go all electronic tolling, and that was removing those cash toll lanes that you would see along the along the facility. And that was to improve safety, um, reduce emissions, and just make an overall better customer experience for the drivers. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but we are not tax funded. We do not receive any local, state, or federal funding. So we are a completely user financed transportation network. We still have about 1.3 billion in bond debt. So as we like to say, it's like um, any person has a mortgage on their home, that is our mortgage on the road. And we do have annual bond debt payments between 100 to 115 million that we um, owe every year. We are scheduled to be paid off in 2041. Next slide, please. 
So here you'll see our transaction history. Obviously that orange line, um, as you all probably know, is from the pandemic. Um, just this um, last year, we finally reached up there. Um, 2023, we did finally surpass our 2019 pre-pandemic numbers. And that yellow line on the far left, that is so far 2024. We are again um, seeing that continued increase year over year. Next slide. So this is something we like to really highlight um, as a lot of expenses have gone up and um, especially with projects that you've prob probably all experienced um, with inflation and everything. We were very proud that our board of directors um, supported that we actually reduced toll rates during the pandemic. So you'll see there in um, 2022, we reduced our express toll and license plate toll rates. And that was following several years from 2018 to 2021 of actually freezing our toll rates. Um, and then the last two years, our board of directors has continued to freeze those um, 2022 reduced toll rates. Uh, at the bottom there, you see some fees that were eliminated um, just before COVID, and that was the vehicle registration fee that was paid by the three counties that our road runs through, and um, also the highway expansion fees. Those were bonds that were paid off, and so our board did um, vote to eliminate those fees. Next slide, please. So my final slide before turning it back over to Neil, um, this is the in the community. Uh, at the title of the slide deck was E470 more than a road. And that's one of the reasons why we're wanting to get out and talk to our partners and talk to our member jurisdictions um, so that we can show that we're more than just pavement or more than just a road. Um, so as I mentioned in 2001 is when we launched our Transportation Safety Foundation. We hold annual golf tournaments um, to raise funds for that. And there, no tax revenue goes towards this foundation. It's purely um, raised um, fundraising dollars. And just last year we had a, um, a very, we set a record with uh, donating $60,000 in grants to um, local uh, programs that are supporting transportation, safety, and education. We also have an E-470 Good Guys team, and that's been around for um, close to 15 years, and that's purely volunteer. That's staff um, within E-470 and our customer service contractor, WSP. They um, donate their time, they donate resources, and get out in the community to help um, support those initiatives. Uh, sponsorships, we sponsor all of our eight member jurisdictions with e um, an equal amount of um, money and we go to the local fairs we go to um, events that they have and are there to answer any questions and um, just provide more information on e470 and then this is what we're doing here in that last one that's connecting with our partners and again just want to get out and be able to answer any questions and share what we have going on so with that um, next slide and i'll turn it over to neil thank you jessica um so jessica said one of our um key core values is collaboration and partnership. And I've listed here some of the projects I've been involved in over the years. Um, you see a variety of um, municipalities, counties and cities here. Um, and I recognize some of the names on the, on the, on the committee here. So it's nice to uh, meet up with you guys again. Um, you'll see other than road projects, you will see some safety projects on there. You'll see electric uh, vehicle charging stations, uh, several trail projects um, and traffic signals. Um, we, we help our, um, our, our local jurisdictions uh, installing traffic signals along the highway, um, another safety project. So this is a mutual regional benefit, we think. Um, and so we do um, partner um, with all of our um, neighbors along the corridor. Next slide. So this is where we kind of um, deal with uh, Jacob at Dr. Cog quite a lot. Um, we did a, a 2020 master plan that we're going to update this year. Um, and really that just um, lays out, you know, where and when we're going to do projects. Um, and we add that to, um, to, to Dr. Cog's regional transportation. Um, this slide um, shows that we're spending quite a lot of money in the next couple of years on our capital projects, including trails, uh, as well as interchanges. Um, and then the master plan there in 2020 identified $1.5 billion in capital projects. There's a big asterisk on that $1.5 billion because, as you all know, since 2020, the cost of projects has increased significantly. So... 
when we um, update our master plan this year, I have a feeling that 1.5 billion is gonna go up a lot. Next slide. So this is one of our um, current major projects to address congestion that we're seeing around about the airport, um, really north of I-70 in Adams County. Uh, we kicked this off um, really about a year and a half ago and we will be complete next year. Uh, we're adding a third lane for about 11 miles. Um, as I said, it's all in Adams County. We're adding a couple of new interchanges to address the development that's happening in Aurora that you're probably aware of at 38th Avenue and 40th Avenue. Uh, we're improving the interchanges at Pena Boulevard and 64th Avenue, and we apologize for uh, any inconvenience you've seen there at Pena particularly. And we're actually adding about six miles um, extension of our trail. Um, this is something that our board is passionate about adding to our regional trail, which will eventually uh, go up and down the entire corridor. Next slide. So talking about trails, I just want to briefly touch on three trail projects that we have with um, some of uh, you guys in the um, committee actually. Starting down south, um, uh, this is a project to connect our High Plains Trail with the Cherry Creek Trail uh, across Parker Road. And we've been working with uh, Town of Parker and Arapahoe County on that. And my understanding is that project will be complete this year. Uh, we're really excited to be a partner there. And halfway up last year, we partnered with Aurora uh, by funding that trail connection to Jewel Avenue. And then at the very top, uh, we've been working with Adams County on their uh, Riverdale Bluffs open space. Um, we've rerouted our regional trail through their open space project, which gives a better trail user experience. Um, so we're certainly open to partnering uh, with our neighboring jurisdictions on trails. Next slide. We also partner with the um, the trucking industry significantly in the last few years. Um, E470 is now a desert. As of a couple of years ago, we worked hard with the state on this designation. And what this does is get any hazmat or gives the opportunity for any hazmat trucks to use E470 as opposed to neighboring streets. Um, so it gets it off the city and county streets uh, and onto a safer facility like E470, uh, at least gives them that option. As Jessica said, we've also worked to um, give um, discounts to trucking on E470 at certain times of the day, again, to get trucks off of um, the local streets and onto E470. Next slide. So all ties into safety, which is a, a personal passion of mine uh, to try and make um, the corridor safer. And it goes to, I think Emily was talking earlier, um, trying to reduce accidents everywhere. Uh, wrong way driver, um, that's a, something we've worked on hard and some, um, hopefully some technology improvements coming up with the cameras that are now being introduced. Um, I believe thermal cameras are going to help there. We've introduced this cable barrier in the median along the entire corridor, and we're adding it to prevent uh, vehicle runoffs at um, some areas that have been identified um, in a safety study. We add deer fence. Um, we're pretty much covered up to um, the southern half of our facility, um, and we're continuing that effort north uh, in this current road widening project. So basically we do like to spend money on safety to try and improve um, that part of um, our customers. Next slide. Turn it back over to Jessica. I do see a hand raised. Um, so before I take over in case the question was for Neil, um, Art Griffith, did you have a question? Yeah, hi, Neil. Um, say on the slide where you extended um, the trail kind of in the Douglas County area, I wasn't, uh, sure how far that gold section goes to on that slide. Yeah, that uh, gold section does go all the way up to Parker Road there. I'm not quite sure why it's gold, to be honest with you. Um, 
we've worked hard with Town of Parker, like I say, to get the connection between the gold piece and the purple piece there. Yeah. Um, and that's been an effort. It's been United Nations. There's probably seven or eight ju jurisdictions have contributed to that project. And like I say, in 2024, we will make that connection to the Cherry Creek Trail to um, that really help um, the bikers. Okay, thanks. But the, I think that the gold piece is already in there, but it's the connection that would go up to the dot. It does, yeah. Sorry perfect. for that confusion. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Art. All right. Um, thank you very much, Neil. Um, so continuing on, uh, Neil touched on a lot of the actual safety measures that we have along the facility. We also have always had a free 24-7 roadside assistance team. And then we have our traffic management center that is monitored 24-7 along the roadway. Um, on, the, on the last slide, you saw that we had over 50 cameras that are surveying um, or providing surveillance of the entire roadway. So if we see a stranded motorist or anything, any debris in the roadway, roadside assist out there to take care of that. Um, in addition, they help with any flat tires, fuel, jump start. Um, in 2023, we were about an average assist time of 12 minutes um, with a 30 minute response time. Uh, we assisted over 9,600 customers and fielded over 15,000 customer assists to the traffic management center. And in red there, you see something that we did just um, start last year. We have the star 470. So if any cellular provider, if you just hit star 470 on your cell phone and need assistance, um, you'll be directed uh, right to our traffic management center. Next slide. So also sustainability is a big focus for us. Um, we are working to improve the water quality. We have the Cherry Creek and Bar Milton watersheds that are adjacent to our Roadway. Uh, we do have our non-standard MS4 permit, which was recently extended through 2026. We have staff um, here at the facility that work very hard to make sure we're meeting all of our obligations for this permit so that we can continue um, receiving that. And we're constantly working to educate customers on reducing pollutants, and we uh, practice best management um, whenever we are trying to reduce unwanted vegetation. We also, are, are in 2022, upgraded our electronic our electric vehicle charging stations to fast charging stations. Um, we That allows for four vehicles to charge simultaneously and they receive about an 80% charge in around 30 minutes or less. Next slide. We've also um, installed solar um, facilities and the first um, agencies in the country to do this. So we've been producing energy for over 11 years and it offsets about 44% of our energy needs. And that's through the 15 solar arrays um, along. So I wanted to touch on um, Colorado tolling in general. So we are that purple segment that you see there, the 47 miles, but we also are the tolling services provider for all the toll roads in Colorado. So that includes Northwest Parkway, which extends and connects with us on North End at I-25. And then we also do the back office and tolling services for CDOT's express lanes. So that's US 36, I-25, I-70, and all the express lanes in the state. And what that means is if you have your express toll account, that transponder, whether it's the HOV or the sticker tag, will work on all these toll facilities. And then if you don't, we'll receive a license plate toll statement, and we provide that service for CDOT's express lanes as well. Next slide. So operating statistics is, is just to give you kind of an idea of the volume that goes through our back office. In 2023, we did have over 150 million transactions that were processed, which was about a 15% increase over the year before. And we serviced nearly a million um, calls into our customer service center. And as I mentioned in the last slide, if you do not have an account, then we take a picture of your front and rear license plate. And then we have human image processors that look at those so that we can um, identify the registered vehicle of the owner. And in 2023, we did uh, look at nearly 80 million images, which was also an increase over 2022. So the bottom right there, you'll see our total express toll accounts at about 1.3 million. And we have about 2.3 million active transponders that are issued throughout the state. In 2023, we opened 175,000 new express toll accounts, which was a 16% increase over the year before. Next slide. 
So in closing, before we open up to any additional questions you might have, I um, wanted to touch on our customer service. Every year, the last two months of the year, we open up an annual customer experience survey. And we usually get around 40 to 50,000 customers respond to that survey. And in the last one, you can see there, the express to customer satisfaction is 4.66 out of five. And the road condition satisfaction is 4.61. Um, year over year customers um, value most important to them is that E470 is kept free of snow. And the number one reason that customers choose E470 is to save time. Um, you see a couple of graphics there on the right. Uh, we did a third party economic impact study a couple of years ago, and um, it showed that with E470 being in existence, that saves about 43.2 million hours of drive time saved on an annual basis. Um, and we do uh, show these customer satisfaction and survey results on our website. Um, we also have after call surveys that are reported out on real time as well, just to be fully transparent and share what our customers are saying and, and how they feel. So with that, um, next slide is just our question slide. And if anybody has any questions, we are available to answer. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil Thompson and Jessica Carson for that E470 update. Um, first hand I see is Sean Poe, Commerce City. Hi, I appreciate the update. and uh, Some really cool metrics to take back and report to our leadership. Um, thanks for the, the time and efforts. Uh, just a quick question, Neil, could you go over um, what funding mechanisms you guys are using and partnering with Aurora on those new interchanges? Uh, yes, Sean, it varies. Um, we're dealing with metro districts primarily in Aurora. Um, and we have IGAs with them. They are government agencies. Um, so we do negotiate uh, funding share with them um, based on, you know, what kind of traffic they're going to generate um, and what kind of return on investment, frankly, that we're going to get. Um, so Aurora Highlands at 38th Avenue, for example, right now, I think is, you know, tens of thousands of new homes getting built there. So we shared the cost of that interchange uh, so that those residents um, could access E470 to get to the airport, et cetera. So, um, yeah, we, we do IGAs with the uh, local metro districts. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments from the Dr. Cogtack? Art Griffith. Yeah, um, you were mentioning the thermal cameras about the vehicles uh, going the wrong direction. Could you elaborate just uh, another minute on that? That seems like something we could glean from. Has it been tested elsewhere? Yeah, my understanding are, is that this has been used in Texas and we're kind of just looking at that right now. Um, right now we um, we have some, uh, you know, tolling loops and those tell us if a vehicle is going in the wrong direction. But of course, not all ramps um, have tolling loops. So we're looking at supplementing that with these um, thermal image cameras, which by all accounts are, are extremely effective. Uh, we want to just test that um, by talking to the agency down in Texas, um, as opposed to frankly, uh, listen to the sales talk um, from the camera man manufacturer, but it does look promising. Um, so more to come on that. Thank you. I don't see any more hands. I'll just wait another moment. If there's any additional questions or comments. Chair, Chair Grant, this is Ron Papsdorf for Dr. Cox. Yes, Ron. Thank you. Um, Jessica, this might be a question for you. I um, really appreciate the statement about E470 um, not using any tax revenue, which I do today. Can you tell us how much um, money was raised with, uh, I think it was a $10 vehicle registration fee assessed to the counties along E-470 at the beginning part until 2018. Some people might consider that a tax for E-470, just curious. Yeah, it was, um, I don't have the exact amount, um, but happy to to follow up and share that with, with Cam or, or Sarah. 
but that was voted on by the three counties before the creation of E470 as a funding mechanism to help get the road started in the early in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I don't know the exact amount of that bond. Um, Neil, I'm not sure if you do, but once it was paid off, as, as you noted, in 2018, the board of directors did vote to eliminate that once the, the bonds were paid off. Um, but I can get an exact amount for you. I just don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Just really curious, kind of curious, because I know that that was a really important component, obviously, for E470 to have a demonstrated revenue stream in order to support bonding at the beginning to, to start construction on the facility. So I'm just curious how much that raised over time. I will look at that. That's a great question. And it was absolutely critical for the creation of E470. And if I could just point out one thing that might make our CDOT partners a little jealous, if I do math roughly closely and assume that the entirety of E470 is six lanes, which I know it's not, um, that would be something on the order of about 282 lane miles for the facility. And um, E470 has 22 plows, which is um, about 12 or 13 miles per plow whereas CDOT has something on the order of about 950 plows for its statewide system, which is 23,000 lane miles, which means double that, 24 miles per, 24 miles, lane miles per plow. Um, so Jessica, get more plows. <laughs> well, thank you for the time. Um, and for those that have the link to these slides, um, Neil and I's contact information is on that final slide. So please reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to item number eight, Metro Vision Amendments. This is attachment F in your packet. Hand it over to Zachary Feldman, Manager of Data and Analytics. Dr. Cock. I think we'll wait just a moment for um those in the room to, ah, here we go. Uh, great. Uh, we're just going to give a quick update on some of the changes to the Metro Vision amendments. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So just a bit of background. Um, these uh, these measures are, are primarily to gauge overall progress towards some of the Metro Vision goals. And, and importantly, they're not intended to evaluate individual jurisdictions or projects. Uh, they're really only being used at the national level, or excuse me, the regional level. Um, we're gonna be looking at three measures today, two of them around high-risk areas um, and one of them around safety. As we see in MetroVision, Dr. Cog's staff at times may need to update um, these measures in order for MetroVision to be flexible and, and dynamic and up to date. Um, these measures need to be updated as the data sources themselves change or um, policy around those change. High risk areas in MetroVision, we're looking at um, sort of two areas, um, fire risk and flood risk. Um, and then we're looking at the share of employment in these high risk areas and the share of housing in these high risk areas. Primarily the piece of interest now is that the Colorado State Forest Service that produced the prior wildfire threat data uh, which was published in 2012, is no longer produced. So they've changed their methodology um, fairly drastically in the last few years using um, different imaging um, and different algorithms for estimation. Um, so they have a new measure called burn probability, which is, um, it gives a different range and it gives us slightly different results in different areas. So we need to read baseline um, the high risk measures in order to set new targets. Though we'll be, we'll be seeing we keep the relative change the same as the old targets and baseline. So here is the um, prior map where we defined um, 
high fire threat from the fire threat index of the Colorado Forest Service. And here's the new one for burn probability um, from the Colorado Forest Service. So we can see that there's been, while there's probably been some change on the ground, um, most of this change is coming from methodology at the Colorado State Forest Service. So here are the, are the proposed baselines. So the 2020 baseline for housing in high-risk areas would now be 3.7% with a 2040 target of 3.1. And employment in high risk would, would be a new 2020 baseline of 1.8 and a 2040 target of 1.6. So those baselines are the estimates of housing and employment in these high-risk areas currently. And these adjustments are happening to um, these targets are set using the same proportional um, change from the old baseline and targets, just accounting for that uh, prior we were looking at a longer time period. So we've adjusted to be looking at a shorter window from 2020 to 2040. And here we can see um, where those changes are in kind of, in kind of table form. Um, and these, we can see previously we were looking at 2014 to 2040. Now we're looking at 2020 to 2040. So we looked at a relatively smaller um, change over this time period since we've got less of a runway um, to keep it consistent with the old measure. Now and I'll provide a quick overview on the traffic fatalities measure. There is only one measure that we are looking to adjust in MetroVision currently. It is the number of traffic fatalities. This one is coming out of recent board actions and guidance. So the performance measure looks at the number of traffic-related fatalities. That includes all modes um, that we have for our data. Um, we are looking at amending this just based on board action that occurred after MetroVision was adopted, um, the adoption of taking action on Regional Vision Zero back in 2020. Um, since then, we have aligned more of our processes to this philosophy. The loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility, so aligning some of our federal performance measures, some of our other planning products to this ultimate goal of Vision Zero in the region. And so we are looking at updating the baseline and the target through this amendment based on board guidance and the adoption of taking action on regional vision zero. So you can see what that looks like because we are looking at the adoption of taking action on regional vision zero as this um, new baseline. We are setting that baseline at 2020, which is when the plan was adopted, keeping that target year of 2040, um, but changing our target from fewer than 100 annually as it is currently shown in MetroVision and establishing a zero target for the region by 2040. So the uh, baseline value would also update to reflect this new 2020 year for the baseline. That concludes our presentation, Chair. We wanted to um, provide you all a quick overview of a process that's concurrent with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan amendments. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Zachary. Any questions for Dr. Cogstaff from the tech? Seeing none, it appears there's a very thorough introductory overview um, for these Metro Vision amendments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that update. Well, unless there's anything on, we will move on to um, our last discussion item. This will be um, item number nine, active transportation plan update. Attachment G in your packet. Hand it over to Aaron Villery, Senior Active Transportation Planner. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, so my name is, is Aaron Villery. I'm the Senior Active Transportation Planner um, at Dr. Cog, and I'm here today to talk about our uh, uh, soon-to-be kicking off update to the Regional Active Transportation Plan. Um, so what this project is, um, it is a major update to our active transportation plan, which was previously adopted. Our current ATP was adopted in 2019, uh, so this is a regular update to the plan. 
Uh, this is identified in our current uh, uh, UPWP. Um, and the goal of this is really to support walking, bicycling, and other active modes of transportation throughout the region. And so uh, this plan will, will name uh, policies and programs um, and set guidance for uh, member governments uh, to support active transportation. Um, uh, we'll also be working uh, extensively with our partners throughout the region in order to develop and, and also adopt this update to the plan. Uh, and, and really the reason for doing this now is we want to respond to emerging trends and challenges uh, in active mobility uh, over the past five years especially. Um, so just to name some of those and, and why there, we, we're, we're feeling a lot of urgency around this uh, plan update is, is there are some pressing challenges that we're facing that have really emerged uh, between 2019 and now. Uh, the last time I uh, was able to speak to this committee was about an update to our uh, um, active mode crash report, uh, which really identified that we are in the, uh, in the midst of a pedestrian safety crisis, that uh, pedestrian uh, fatalities and severe injuries in the region have accelerated um, quite significantly over the past decade. Um, and so this, this is a, a trend that we are trying to respond to with our regional vision zero, uh, work, but also want to uh, center in this plan, uh, as well as escalating costs to implement. I think this is named, uh, at least in one other presentation today, that uh, costs of implementing uh, projects and programs uh, to support active transportation uh, have escalated, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic period. Um, and then uh, addressing new and emerging uh, modes using active transportation infrastructure that I'm, I'm sure you all uh, have in mind uh, on a daily basis. Um, and addressing congestion and air quality as the region grows. Um, so really aligning with some of our other uh, core uh, work and initiatives. Uh, additionally, since the last plan was adopted, we've just seen some really exciting innovations undertaken by member governments in this region. Uh, some really significant advances in multimodal design best practices and the way that we implement walk and bike facilities and the have to integrating those into our uh, transportation system. Uh, some significant um, advances and uh, pilots in planning and delivery approaches into how uh, networks and, and systems are, are planned um, and, uh, and actually implemented. Um, and of course, new uh, types of devices and options that really expand access to walking and bicycling uh, and active use for people of varying ages and abilities. Uh, so things like e-bikes and uh, adaptive bicycles and, um, and cargo bikes and um, all those uh, exciting things that, that we're starting to see in the right of way. Um, additionally, uh, member governments have really uh, thought progressively around public incentives and what are some of the opportunities to expand access and uh, specifically to expand equitable access to uh, active transportation. And then finally, uh, some changes to uh, how these projects and programs are funded, opportunities are. Uh, to deliver them. And then finally, uh, I don't need to tell this group, but um, I will just underline uh, that the landscape in transportation uh, has really shifted nationally and regionally, um, that the COVID-19 pandemic shifted our travel habits and, and we've sort of settled into perhaps a new normal um, and we're still understanding what that might be, um, that the region's shared micromobility systems have evolved and, and we've gone from a, a station-based system to uh, mostly dock, uh, dockless systems throughout the region, um, and that has really changed the way that those systems are used. Um, the expansion of, of electric assist bicycles and other micromobility options have, have really changed the way that people think about um, and, and utilize extra transportation structure. And then finally, uh, our work doesn't happen in a vacuum um, that uh, uh, people living in the region are experiencing increasing cost burden and economic pressure, and so that really shapes transportation decisions. So the purpose of this plan uh, is to update the Regional Act Transportation Plan, which will set a vision for walking and bicycling in the region. And really, we want to focus on providing tools and guidance for member governments and partners throughout the region to, to set a vision for how people uh, can move and, and have free access um, by uh, active use, um, and uh, how to provide a, a set of shared practices and, and create a real community of practice um, in, uh, throughout our, our jurisdictions. Uh, and this plan will identify actions for Dr. Cog to undertake to support the. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, some of the scope elements of this extra transportation plan. Uh, this is sort of where the, the rubber hits the pavement. Um, 
we went through a competitive uh, consultant selection process um, uh, this winter um, and are currently in, in negotiations with the consultant team um, uh, with the approval of our finance and budget committee uh, of, of our board. Um, and so uh, we are planning to undertake these sort of seven primary elements uh, to deliver this plan. Um, the, the first and, um, and certainly largest among our, our efforts is going to be uh, building member and stakeholder capacity and conducting inclusive and substantive engagement. We are trying to be very intentional and strategic around our engagement so that we're really bringing, uh, using this opportunity to bring members together to share emerging practices, to, um, to really develop new ideas and, and, and uh, share our work with one another and, and advance the state of the practice. Um, as well as, as being very targeted in our public engagement so that we're identifying uh, folks who are facing barriers to using the actual transportation system and really making sure that our ultimate plan addresses those barriers and makes a more universally um, accessible system. Uh, so we're um, going to be doing a lot of really substantive and strategic engagement. Updating the regional active transportation network. So uh, currently, uh, I, I think the most direct use case that people have when, um, uh, in this group when interacting with their active transportation plan is the, the three-part network, our regional uh, active transportation corridors, our short trip opportunity zones, and our pedestrian focus areas um, that we use in, in things like scoring for the transportation improvement program um, and uh, integrating with our other data tools in, in the regional plan. And so um, updating that network, looking at changes in population and in mobility um, and uh, land use and, and um, uh, refresh that network. Um, developing guidance. Um, the third one is developing guidance to accelerate completion of the regional pedestrian network that we are really thinking about how to accelerate the um, filling in some of the gaps in the sidewalk network throughout the region and uh, focusing on accessibility in those um, in that work and, and developing some uh, or updating some of the tools available uh, to, to members, to your engineering and planning teams around uh, how to uh, deliver those projects faster and, uh, and better. Updating guidance around emerging micromobility, uh, design and infrastructure. And this, uh, again, encompasses uh, some feedback that we got when consulting with members and uh, some of the different work groups in developing this scope was that there are all these new devices out in, um, on our systems and uh, people would really appreciate some guidance around how to uh, accommodate those and, and mitigate conflicts and um, open access to, to some of those uh, travel options. Um, the fifth one, we want to analyze the economic benefits of active transportation investments and really just understand, you know, what are the costs uh, that people are generally paying to implement some of these projects and uh, what kinds of economic impacts can they uh, see locally. So what is the, uh, the potential benefit of completing the active transportation network? Uh, finally, we'll be assess or, yeah, assessing Dr. Cog programs and policies and coming up with some uh, actionable recommendations for how we can continue to support uh, you all, our member jurisdictions. Um, and then, of course, producing an actionable plan um, that is accessible, that is appealing and, and ready to implement. Um, so my ask for this group today, or, or just sort of uh, uh, our next step uh, that I'm very excited about is as we uh, prepare to kick off the project in April, um, we're going to be uh, conducting outreach to start forming the plan advisory group. We anticipate uh, that this is the group that will really guide and shape the project uh, really from um, start to finish. And so this will be composed of Dr. Cog's staff, um, essentially of, of member government staff. Um, as well as our partners at CDOT and RTD. And we sort of see it as a core group uh, who will be helping to shape the project, who will be principally interested in active transportation, but we also wanna engage uh, thoughtfully throughout the process with different subject matter experts. So uh, pedestrian and sidewalk program managers, bicycle program managers, um, uh, ADA coordinators, if your city or town or county has uh, an ADA coordinator, um, uh, safe routes to school managers. These are some examples, but also we're, we're looking for guidance on um, who else we're not thinking of, you know, your city's traffic engineer or, um, or you know, other roles that, um, that can provide guidance that has strategic intervals in, uh, to the plan. And then, of course, uh, with that core plan advisory group, we're also anticipating a community advisory group that will meet alongside that, that internal advisory group. Uh, and these are really the community members who have 
a lens into specific issues and barriers. Again, bringing um, forward that idea of, of people who I um, experience barriers to using extra transportation and how can we engage uh, with those groups and, and create universal solutions. Um, so these are some examples that come to mind for us. But we're also uh, going to begin conducting outreach uh, and, and want to sort of plant the seed today of um, who else, who are we not thinking of, uh, who beyond, um, uh, you know, accessibility advocates and uh, Im important, you know, parks and recreation districts, uh, TMAs, um, business improvement districts um, that, that we should be engaging throughout the process. We're anticipating uh, or we're, we're sort of giving ourselves about 18 months. Um, because of the uh, intensity of the engagement um, to complete this project. So this is a very generalized schedule, but really we'll, we're planning to kick off uh, in, in April. Um, and so look forward to communications um, around kicking off and, and starting to form those stakeholder groups, um, uh, extending through the end of this year, and then really getting into draft plan review and uh, finalization early next year. Um, so that is it. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions um, or uh, receive any comments, and I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for that update. Any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff on the active? I don't see any hands. Uh, once again, thank you for that great overview of the upcoming update. I think we're all looking forward to participating in that effort. Thank you, Erin. Okay, I think uh, we're just, that was our last item and uh, we'll close out with administrative items. Item number 10 in your packet. This is member comment and other matters. And I believe Dr. Cog wanted to provide a bit of an overview of safe streets and roads for all. And the request from Dr. Um, Cog. Thank you, Chair Grant. Yeah, I'll mention a couple other thing, a couple things under other matters. Um, first, just sort of housekeeping, our next meeting, our April meeting will be April 29th instead of April 22nd. That should be updated on your calendars already. Um, and then yes, as Chair Grant alluded to, uh, we did include in the packet this month some information around uh, safe streets and roads for all, specifically the fact that Dr. Cog um, is working hard towards an anticipation of submitting for an implementation grant. Um, we are talking with many local governments. We actually uh, sent out, and this is what's included in the packet, is a letter of um, letter of interest around um, local project sponsors who may have a project to include um, in our regional implementation grant. Technically, the LOI closed at the end of last week, um, but we did want to get it in the packet. We did want to socialize it with you. Um, I'd invite Emily to speak any more to the LOI or kind of our next steps on our implementation grant. Um, yeah, so we received, uh, I think we've received officially nine LOIs and um, we are encouraging folks to please still, if you are interested to submit those in the next couple of days, if we have had conversations with you, um, please get those in. Um, the next steps for us are to finalize those lists of partners. Um, we're hoping to have that final list complete by April 10th. And then um, in the meantime, we'll be reaching out to all those partners um, regarding any specific details we need to fill out the, the narrative for the application. That's all we have. Thank you, Chair Grant. Well, thank you. Thank you for that update. Are there any other um, updates or matters from the TAC? I'm not sure if we have an update from the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group, Carson. Uh, not this month, Chair. They've moved that meeting to every other month, so we'll have one next time. Perfect. Thank you for that update, Carson. Any other um, updates from TAC members you would like to bring to the Dr. Cog TAC? Checking the list, and I don't see any hands up. So seeing none, as um, Jacob Rieger had mentioned, the next meeting will actually be um, the last April, uh, math, I'm sorry, the last Monday in April, which will be April 29th. 
And if you didn't, uh, if we didn't call your name out at the beginning, please do reach out to Cam Kennedy at ccennedy at drcog.org to be sure that you've been accounted for attending the meeting. And at this point, we are adjourned for the Dr. Cog TAC at 3.20 p.m. Thank you for your attendance and participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.